Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we riff, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month on up as high as you want and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there and uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo, right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. This is a re-slash of Friday the 13th, Church of the Divine Psychopath by Scott Phillips. Prologue. At the bottom of the lake, the corpse, anchored to the sediment on the lake bed by several concrete blocks, twirled slowly in the current. The ropes that bound the body were waterlogged and fraying, and one dead arm had come free, drifting upwards to point limply towards the surface in the sunlight. Up above, a slight breeze urged a procession of gentle ripples across the surface of the lake, rolling ceaselessly towards the shore. A few birds spun overhead in easy circles. A squirrel scurried along the water's edge, ducking in and out of the grass. From somewhere, muffled voices could be heard. It was a warm spring day at Crystal Lake, and the mutilated corpses of his previous victims had long since been cleared away. Beneath the lake, the murderer rested, suspended in gloomy silence, eyes closed behind the battered hockey mask that obscured his dead face. Occasionally, a hungry fish would dart in to pick at his decomposing flesh, tearing away a meaty morsel. And every minute of every day, the rope that held him there rotted a little, becoming more and more frail, loosening their hold on the corpse. Every minute of every day, he slipped from their grasp a bit more, inching towards the surface of the lake. How long had it been since the corpse of Jason Voorhees had been delivered back into the cold waters of Crystal Lake? Weeks? Years? Could the time be measured in butchered bodies and the spilling of blood? Voorhees' final victims had been just as foolish as those who died before them. They had heard the stories, of course. They knew why the place was called Camp Blood. But like so many others, they hadn't believed the tales or had thought that it couldn't happen to them. The teenage girl had died first, died shrieking in terror, her breasts jiggling as the air was expelled from her lungs. Jason Voorhees had held her slender wrist clasped tightly in one huge hand, yanking her from the collapsed tent and hoisting her upwards until her bare feet left the ground. Her agonizing screams rose in pitch, accompanied by a loud popping sound as her left arm was dislocated from the shoulder and wrenched from the socket. Movement nearby caught Jason's attention. The boy was getting away, scrabbling backwards from the ruined tent and staring open-mouthed at his nude girlfriend, 
who thrashed back and forth like a rag doll in Jason's grasp. The boy was also buck naked, but he hadn't thought about reaching for his clothes when a machete blade ripped and slashed through the nylon wall of the tent. Too bad. Too... He'd been tearing off one fine piece of ass before the psycho killer had interrupted his good times. As he scrabbled backwards, the rocks and sand beneath him, scraping the exposed flesh of his ass, he couldn't help but wish he had listened to his friends. Stay away from Camp Blood. The machete entered the girl's torso just above her left hip, glancing off the glistening bone and sinking deeply into the soft flesh of her belly. She gasped painfully as the tip of the blade punched through her back. She could feel her blood running down her thighs in thick, warm ribbons. Then Jason savagely worked the machete blade upwards past her navel, the brutal slicing motions coming to a stop as the edge of the blade sawed into a rib. Something else was oozing out of the gaping wound. Before she died, the girl glanced down to see her steaming intestines spilling from the gash in her belly, sliding along in the blood to become entangled in her frantically kicking legs. Jason Voorhees stared at the dying girl without emotion as her life stuttered and twitched to an unpleasant end. Whipping the corpse around like a child's toy, the killer looked past her, watching the teenage boy as he stumbled to his feet and began to run towards the lake. Effortlessly, Jason hurled the lifeless body of the girl into the bushes and gave chase, purposefully striding after the terrified teenage boy. The boy let out an awkward girlish squeal when he realized Jason was pursuing him, hunting him. Foolishly, he splashed out into the water, as if he could find safety and refuge from the maniac. He yelped as he stepped on something sharp, then lost his balance and fell face first into the lake. An instant later, he burst from the water, choking and gasping. He whirled back towards shore, which was empty. Jason Voorhees was nowhere to be seen. With spit dribbling down his chin, the frightened teenage boy stood trembling in the freezing water, staring wide-eyed at the shoreline. The guy was huge. No way could he have disappeared so fast. Splashing, the boy spun to his left, Nothing. Back to the right. Still nothing. The moon was nearly full, casting a soft light over the scene. He should have been able to see him. The boy tried very, very hard to quell his shivering. Not making a sound as he listened intently for some sign that the killer was still out there. After a moment, he slowly began wading back towards dry land not letting himself blink, eyes flicking back and forth, as vigilant as someone who's had way too much to drink, and then watch their girlfriend get sliced open like a strung-up hog could possibly be. Stepping out of the water, he paused, demurely holding his hands in front of his groin. Still no sign of Jason. Maybe the killer had got what he wanted with the girl's death. Maybe. Maybe not. Nervously, the boy walked back towards the demolished tent, carefully picking his way across the rocky shoreline. He noticed his foot was bleeding, probably from whatever he stepped on in the lake. Gonna need a tetanus shot for that. As he neared the tent, he saw the snarl of entrails splayed out across the shredded nylon and the expensive sleeping bags. Blood was everywhere. The boy's lower lip trembled as his eyes traced the trails of guts off into the underbrush, where Jason had flung the girl's corpse. He forced himself to move, gingerly following the ribbons of intestine. Her dead eyes stared up at him, blood pulling in one of the sockets. She didn't look so goddamn sexy anymore, not like she had at the kitty concert where they'd met. Not like she had only moments earlier when enjoying frantic, sweaty sex. He realized that he was still wearing the condom. Gasping in dismay, he yanked it free and threw it into the bushes. Then a hand clamped tightly around his neck. Thick fingers sank into the boy's throat, compressing his windpipe. 
His feet left the ground as Jason lifted him upwards. The boy struggled to twist his head to see the killer, but the grip on his neck was too strong. Jason swung the machete with inhuman force. The blade sank into the boy's right side, just under the ribcage, and went clean through his spine. The lower half of his body, legs still kicking, swung away from the upper half as organs and more fleshy body parts spilled out onto the ground. Jason dropped the lifeless body atop the girls in a sick parody of the position they'd been in when he'd caught them originally. Turning, the masked murderer stared at the lantern lights burning in the distance at the old campground. There were others, but like so many times before, it had ended abruptly. Like so many times before, someone had tricked Jason, been faster than Jason, and he had been killed and his body sent back to the lake. Like so many times before, the body was never recovered. They'd missed it somehow even with all their searching, and the ropes that held him were rotting. Animated by the current of the lake, the body of Jason Voorhees continued to turn in lazy circles, each rotation of the corpse causing the ropes to fray a little more. Above, a shadowy figure appeared, its image distorted by the motion of the waves. The surface of the water stirred. Chapter 1. Kelly Mills steered her crappy old Honda Civic into the strip mall's parking lot. The car groaned uncomfortably, displeased by Kelly's use of the brake pedal. Don't die, don't die, Kelly pleaded with the vehicle. Wrenching the wheel, she guided the clunker into a parking space where it lurched to a halt. Snapping Kelly's head forward. Something hissed beneath the hood and the car shuddered violently as the engine finally gave up. Still holding the steering wheel, Kelly looked at the recently washed, late model SUV parked in the space next to her. Her distorted reflection gazed back from the glistening chrome trim running the length of the vehicle. Kelly sighed longingly. The Honda was older than she was. Her mother had squeezed a couple hundred thousand miles out of the 1980 Civic before bestowing it upon Kelly. Now it just felt like one more manifestation of the disdain her mother had for her. Maybe the mean old cow was right. Why should someone like Kelly deserve anything nice anyway? Better things to think about, Kelly thought. She checked herself out in the mirror. For a moment, she considered pulling her brown hair into a prim little ponytail. Don't want to look too sexy for church, after all. But then she thought about Father Long. Man of God, he may be. But Kelly had seen the cute little gleam in his eye when he looked her way. Kelly laughed out loud. After the parade of delinquents she dated in high school, what would her mama say if she knew Kelly had her sights set on a preacher man? And one in his forties at that. She tried to tell herself it wasn't sinful. Then she adjusted her blouse to reveal the tiniest hint of cleavage and got out of the car. The ministry of the heavenly vessel occupied a small storefront in the strip mall, its interior hidden behind flower print curtains. Only one can mete out judgment, promised a hand-painted sign resting in the window sill. Hundreds of dead flies littered the sill from end to end, piled a half inch deep in places. Kelly braced herself and opened the door. A wave of hot air spilled out, thick with the stench of body odor and bad perfume. The church couldn't afford air conditioning, and there were a lot of folks crammed into the small space. A good 35 or 40 God-fearing stink producers of every age, size, and shape. The old people seemed to put off the worst reek, a sour, stinging smell like rotted meat soaked in vinegar. Sometimes, under the bouquet of drenched underarms and sweaty thighs, 
Kelly could pick up the faint aroma of cookies or cake, baked by one of the churchgoers. She'd never had the stomach to eat any of the stuff, however. The congregation was just settling into their seats as Kelly entered. The stink seemed worse tonight, somehow. Something new added to the usual mix of odors. She returned a number of smiles and waves as she took her own seat near the front, a metal folding chair that always put her right butt cheek to sleep. The murmured bits of conversation Kelly could hear died away as Father Eric Long stepped out from behind a partition at the front of the room. Curtis Rickles at his side, as always. Rickles made Kelly uncomfortable, though she tried to hide it. A former Marine, Rickles had lost all of his upper front teeth and most of his left foot. Not in combat, but in some sort of accident. He seemed a little skinny to be a Marine, Kelly thought. She turned her attention to Father Long, who was standing with hands in pockets, gazing out across the faces of his followers. A tiny smile on his face. Not the most good-looking of men, but there was something about him Kelly couldn't put her finger on although she was certainly willing to put more than that on him, given the opportunity. She wasn't sure she'd ever known anyone with charisma before, but if the stuff existed, Long had a bunch of it. She was disappointed when Long turned and strode to the church's makeshift altar without acknowledging her. Rickles took up his usual position nearby, arms folded across his chest. As Long placed his hands on the podium and leaned forward to look upon the faces before him once more, his eyes finally fell on Kelly. There was that gleam again. A ripple of schoolgirl giddiness wriggled through her body. Hot in here, isn't it? Long began. A few of the congregation chuckled as he pulled a handkerchief from his back pocket and wiped his brow. We won't have to worry about that much longer. He replaced the handkerchief and leaned forward on the podium again. We have a new home. The room erupted in applause, snapping Kelly out of her long-induced reverie. Embarrassed, she awkwardly began clapping along. Yes. Smiling humbly, Long gestured for quiet. I know you've all been looking forward to it and I finally signed the papers to lease the land. Another smattering of applause. We leave before the week is out. This time, Long's words brought whistles and cheers as well as clapping. It was what Kelly loved about the ministry, and Long. He brought all these people together, made them feel like they were part of something special, made her feel special. This time, Long let the applause play out, shooting a playful shrug at Rickles. When the hubbub finally died down, a solemn expression came over Long. When he spoke, his voice was barely above a whisper. I know that having faith can sometimes be a burden. Your friends, sometimes even your family, can make you feel like, well, like there's something wrong with you for believing so strongly. Long locked eyes with Kelly. She gasped audibly, then looked away, reddening. What happens to a prophet in this day and age? Long continued louder now. We all know. We all watch the news. A prophet is shunned, ridiculed, maybe even killed for what he believes, what he gives voice to. Long stepped back from the podium, giving a slight nod to Rickles. Rickles in turn gestured to two other men, and the three disappeared behind the partition. Pulling his handkerchief again, Long mopped the sweat from his face. I'm not talking about myself. I wouldn't be so bold. Look at your neighbor, the good person sitting next to you. That person is the prophet. We are, all of us, the prophet. And those who ridicule and deny... Long took a deep breath, exhaling slowly. 
I am sad for them. Truly sad. As if on cue, Rickles reappeared, shoving the partition aside. Behind it, the other two men stood on either side of a sheet spread across a bulky form laid out on the floor. Kelly craned her neck, trying to get a better look. A smile spread across Long's face. Sad for them, he said, turning to face his flock again. Because they are so unprepared. With that, Rickles and the other men bent to take hold of whatever was beneath the sheet. Rickles at the top, the two men on either side. Struggling under its weight, they wrestled the thing into an upright position next to the altar, nearly scraping the ceiling in the process. Kelly was reminded of the photo of the Marines raising the flag on Iwo Jima. Long moved to stand next to the covered object. Kelly suddenly felt uneasy. Something about Long's smile had changed almost imperceptibly. With a grandiose gesture, Long yanked the sheet away. A collective gasp rose from the congregation. Kelly felt the contents of her stomach struggle to rise as she stared at the source of that new stench that she'd noticed when she arrived. Long spread his arms before the massive wooden cross and the figure bound to it. I feel sad for them because the hand of judgment, the heavenly vessel, will soon be resurrected and they will know that they have sinned. Upon the cross, lashed tightly to the thick beams with heavy rope, hung the lifeless body of Jason Voorhees. A single maggot wriggled from the right eye hole of his battered hockey mask. Kelly watched it squirm until it dropped to the floor out of her sight. Okay, Slashaholics, that was a preview of what's to come. That was the prologue and chapter one of the re-slash, finally happening, Friday the 13th, Church of the Divine Psychopath by Scott Phillips. I've been really excited to re-narrate this one. I'm going to re-narrate probably like some of the first six or seven books I did on the channel before I started adding sound effects and stuff like that and music. Uh, but this one I was particularly excited to get back to. It was the first book I ever narrated on the channel. I wish I had saved it for a while because I really, en really enjoyed the story. But it's been like five years since I uploaded it. So it's going to be a lot of fun to redo this one from beginning to end. Uh, as of right now, if you're listening to this in the future, this won't make any sense. But as of right now, as I drop this, I'm still narrating Child's Play 1 and Freddy vs. Ash, and after I finish one of those, I'm going to be starting Halloween 5, a fan novelization, and I intended to start this one after those, but as much fun as I had getting back into the character of Father Long, this time with a little more confidence and a little more practice at narrating, I think I may drop chapters of this one, just sprinkle them every now and then until I complete those other ones and then, you know, hit it hard. So just be on the lookout. I may be dropping chapters of this one here and there as little surprise uploads. But as far as the prologue and chapter one go, I love uh, the whole setup of Jason at the bottom of the lake. Almost like he's having memories, you know, even though he's inanimate right now, of the last time he killed. And the whole scene, the murder scene, the way Scott Phillips wrote that, really felt like a Friday the 13th film, like zombie Jason era. And as far as Father Long goes, he's going to be a fun character to voice again. Um, I don't remember everything from this book. I've narrated like 60-something books since this one. Um, but it's going to be a lot of fun to, to dive back into it. I love the whole cult-like mentality. There's actually a lot of that going on these days. Uh, so it's kind of easy to tap into that. And uh, the Southern Church thing, I've actually been to places like that before. Heard people talking like that. 
and uh, they have a real charisma about them to pull all these people in to make them feel like they're like like Kelly was saying part of something special. Um, so this guy's definitely got the charisma, but he's definitely a sociopath. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to dropping more chapters for you guys. Uh, for those of you who have heard my narration of this book already, that was the very first book I ever narrated back in September and the beginning of October 2018. Uh, I would love to, to hear what you guys and gals think of the comparison of the prologue in chapter one then compared to now. Um, and I'll be back a lot sooner than I thought with more of this book. I, I can't say when, but uh, as much as I enjoyed tonight, I don't imagine it being too long. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Good night, happy early Friday the 13th, and I'll see you soon.